Hello again, my fellow learners. Thanks for coming back for part two out of our three-part series as we discuss Animal Farm. Let's start today by looking at the graphic organizer marked literary concept allegory. As we take a look at these historical counterparts in the Russian Revolution to the fictional story Animal Farm, let's start with Leon Trotsky. He was one of the leaders in the Russian Revolution. Uh, well, more precisely, not so much the overthrow, but in the attempt afterwards to install a new government to replace the overthrown Emperor Tsar Nicholas II. Trotsky wanted to honor the ideals of Karl Marx, that is, of communism, which meant, in his mind, uh, equality for all. He was a persuasive speaker, very skilled at building support among the populace for his ideals and his position, but he was chased away by the KGB, that is, the party's secret police, and therefore no longer opposed his chief rival, Stalin. More about him in a moment. Afterwards, the party denounced him as a traitor and a conspirator, both false charges and examples of revisionism. Mentioning Stalin, he, on the other hand, was not interested in the ideals of communism. He instead basically wanted power for himself. He was not a good speaker. Uh, but instead was particularly skilled at eliminating any opposition and uh, also, unfortunately, methodically killing his own people, particularly the proletariat, those who were trying to build the country for him, a sign of true corrupting influence of absolute power. He did not initially favor the move to industrialization. The White Russians were a small group of upper-class, rich landowners who did enjoy some power and influence under Tsar Nicholas before the Revolution. Because of their life of comparative comfort, they really didn't care about the Revolution. In fact, their rich elite status was what fueled the resentment about the privilege that, that uh, sort of led to the Revolution. Many of them fled to other countries hoping to continue their life of comfort once things got hot for them in the Revolution. The Kremlin, historically, was a triangular walled fortress that was the seat of Russian government throughout uh, many centuries, starting in the 1100s. It was associated with the old res oppressive regime, and when the leadership separated themselves and put themselves into the Kremlin, that really signaled that they thought of themselves as uh, separate and not as equal. From there, they made decisions about ruling the Soviet Union. And finally, today for this lecture, let's address Russia's rush to industrialize. The new leaders developed five-year economic plans designed to rapidly catch the Soviet Union up with the rest of the world industrially. To do so, the party forced people into labor camps where the, the poor conditions, oppressive conditions, the unsafe working um, procedures resulted in millions of, of workers dying. The Soviet Union sadly failed to meet any of their five-year plans due to these very unrealistic goals and poor planning. Let's go ahead and flip over your page to the propaganda worksheet and address several of the questions here in this next reading. Starting with number three, Napoleon supports the windmill, so the pigs announce. Now, if you remember correctly, Napoleon did not initially support the windmill. Historical, his, his historical counterpart, Stalin, thought basically it was too much of a move to capitalism. And by the way, communists oppose capitalism because capitalism could lead to inequality of wealth. Now, don't mis mistake Squealer's words in the last paragraph, though as a lie. This isn't exactly technically a lie. He does not so much deny the truth as he changes what actually occurred, the position that Napoleon initially took on the windmill. So what do the pigs gain out of this? Well, let's, let's think about this. Uh, they didn't have to say, I changed my mind. Um, and another advantage could have been electricity. But I think when you consider Napoleon's personality, and you ask why would a totalitarian dictator, one with total control, want to subject his citizens to harsh treatment? Well, let me be pretty direct here. Because he can. That's what he wants to gain. 
Let's go to another issue that gets changed, the issue on a trade with humans. And again, the pigs change their position on this issue. Now, the animals feel a, quote, vague uneasiness about this, that, that something was wrong. But Squealer confronts them and says, well, have you any written record of such a resolution? Basically, can you prove that this is what we said previously? Well, it was what they said previously. He's simply changing their position. Now, if we read the paragraph before this change in policy, we find out that, quote, later there also would be need for seeds and artificial manure and machinery for the windmill. How these were to be procured, no one was able to imagine. So basically, the pigs needed money to continue building and uh, allowing them to continue their oppression. So when the pigs announced that the sale was, quote, not for any commercial or economic purposes, are they telling the truth? Let's go ahead and address number five and number six together, even though they may not appear so on your worksheet there. Two propaganda techniques are used here. First of all, Squealer starts by referring to the pigs as brain workers who need a quiet place. And if they don't get a quiet place, they can't run the farm effectively. And they can't run the farm effectively, well, you know where this chain of cause and effect, this false logic, is going to lead to. This declaring that a, a, a small misstep will result in something horrible happening. You can name that propaganda technique. The second propaganda technique is evident if you look at the wording of the commandment as it originally appears and then as uh, the animals notice it in this part of the story. It has indeed been rewritten. Can you characterize what the pigs are trying to get for themselves? Is that very hard to see how they want to separate themselves and privilege themselves? So be specific here. And finally today, let's talk about uh, number seven and number eight again together. You may go ahead and write your answers together there. Now, it could be possible that Snowball did cause the windmill to fall. But if you read after this event into chapter seven, in the second paragraph, you'll note that the humans believed that the pigs built the walls too thin. They are correct. The pigs say that's not it, but they're going to rebuild them thicker anyway. Well, you can see right through that. As far as the propaganda technique, note that Squealer pins the blame on Snowball. He labels Snowball as the cause of all their problems. Do you remember the name of that technique? And a second technique is involved when, uh, first of all, I believe uh, Napoleon offers a, um, excuse me, Squealer, uh, says there's a, there'll be a national title, a national recognition to whoever captures Snowball. And then later, Napoleon offers a little, uh, a little cheer in favor of Animal Farm, a little promoting of national pride there. You, of course, remember what that's called. Now, hmm, what do the pigs want to accomplish here? Might they be anxious to boost others' confidence in their leadership after this, what they realize is a failed decision? Who made the decision to build the walls only 18 inch thick? Who really is at fault here? That concludes our second of three lectures on Animal Farm. Take careful notes there, replay as you need, and we'll, we will work on uh, completing those answers together in class.